who is uh, a full professor at the Technical University of Graz in Austria. Uh, Roderick, Roderick has uh, worked on many um, aspects of formal methods, uh, verification, synthesis, um, and particularly reactive synthesis. And in recent years, he's been taking reactive synthesis in a very interesting and novel direction, which is uh, this exciting topic of shield synthesis. And so I'm really excited to have Roderick speak about that here today. Welcome. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a great honor to speak at the Simons Institute, even though I'm at home, uh, but still. Uh, so I'll talk about shield synthesis, as uh, Sanjit said. Um, so this is work with a whole bunch of people, uh, but I especially want to uh, uh, mention Bettina Koenighofer. Uh, so she was my uh, PhD student. She finished uh, last year. She's staying on for a little bit more. And uh, she's driven most of this and you know, done most of the collaborations and come up with most of the ideas. Uh, so it's really, it's really her work. All right. <clears throat> so um, the, uh, the idea is uh, you, um, you know how to do synthesis, uh, but you also know it's not perfect. And you want uh, to be able to do a little bit more with that. Um, so to kick off the motivation, I have this uh, slide here that uh, you will probably know. Um, so this is, um, it comes from a newspaper article uh, and it says, um, a software bug led to the death in the Uber self-driving crash. And then it says, uh, sensors detected Elaine Hertzberg, but software reportedly de decided to ignore her. Now, I don't know if this is true, right? Uh, this is a newspaper article and, and you probably should take this with a grain of salt, but, but let's take it as, at, uh, at face value, right? So if, um, if the car actually knew that the pedestrian was there and then the software decided that this is not a big deal, that, that's a really bad thing, right? If, um, if, so from my perspective as a formal methods person, I, I could understand if the software fails to understand uh, that, uh, you know, the picture it's seeing uh, represents pedestrian. This seems to be a complicated thing, but sort of linking the, the, the fact that you've detected the person to the fact that you should stop this should be really simple, right? Uh, it's almost trivial to write down this rule. Uh, you, you sit down with a class of school kids and you ask them, what should a uh, self-driving car do? One of the first things they will tell you is uh, not run into pedestrians. Um, so, so again, I, I'm not sure if, if, if this is really inside of the, of the problem. Is this the root cause? Uh, I don't know. Um, but there's nothing inside of this machine learned system that guarantees that this rule is, uh, is maintained. It's nothing that guarantees that if you see a pedestrian, the car will stop. Um, and, and this should, to my mind, obviously be in there. Um, so let's see if we can sort of do something like that, right? So can, can you combine uh, the smarts uh, that a self-driving car has with sort of the, the guarantees that formal methods have? Um, so I don't believe that you can use formal methods or, or synthesis to just build a self-driving car. Uh, there's too much optimization and, 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 and tuning and smartness in there, uh, but, but to, to enforce simple rules that we should be able to do. Okay, so let's uh, take a step back and, and see what this problem looks like. Um, so if you uh, are a formal methods person, and I think all of you are, then uh, uh, verification or synthesis uh, looks like this, right? There's a system M uh, and there's a formula phi and all you need to do is make sure that there's a double turnstile in between and everything is fine. Um, so why is this difficult? This is difficult because the system is a pain uh, and, and also the specification is a pain, right? So your system is, is large. Uh, it consists of uh, different aspects, uh, analog components, discrete components, machine learned things, uh, hard coded things where you don't have the source code. Uh, I don't know, there might be soft errors in it. There's all kinds of difficulties uh, in 
means sort of being represented into the system. And your specification, if you think of it, um, is, is not so easy either. If you want to write down exactly what a self-driving car should do, this becomes a really difficult thing. Um, you'd have to deal with sort of the smoothness of the steering and the smoothness of the braking and you know, how precisely this works. And these are things you know, where we've made a lot of progress, but we're not perfect at specifying things like that. And uh, it might be easier to, to implement these or, or to learn them. Um, so, um, so, so this seems to be like an impossible problem. Um, and, and I think sort of as far as, as far as the system is concerned, I don't see a lot of hope, right? So you can try and dice it up into little pieces and there's lots of tricks you can play, but in the end, the system is complicated. The spec, spec, I'm not so sure. So I think you don't need such a complicated spec. I think if you're going to talk about the things that, uh, that really matter, there, the specification is small in its suite. Um, so this is, um, may be true, may not be true, but this is the, the, um, the underlying assumption for the talk. Uh, we can come up with a set of specifications that sort of preclude uh, the disastrous, uh, that, that really look at the critical aspects of your system. And these should be sort of simple to specify uh, and they should be small. And I'm also sort of assuming that, that, that this is uh, expressible at all, right? So something like if you see the pedestrian stop the car, this is something you can state. Uh, something like, uh, you know, uh, if, you, uh, if your camera sees a tree, uh, it should actually report tree. I have no idea how to deal with that. So that's sort of outside of the scope of what we'll talk about today. All right. So, so let's um, take this assumption. Let's say we have a complicated system. We have a, a simple spec. And then the next thing you'll try to do is uh, you'll try to verify it. Um, and uh, it's not clear that this will, will succeed, right? Um, if the system is complicated enough, then testing is not going to cut it. Uh, model checking or, or, or any kinds of formal methods uh, may just fail. Um, so this uh, this here's another assumption. The system's so complicated you cannot just verify it. So what do you do? Uh, this is sort of the whole talk here in one slide. Uh, what do you do instead? You build a shield. You build a runtime enforcement module uh, for a reactive system that um, looks at uh, the outputs of the system. It may also look at the inputs, and uh, normally it will say everything's fine. Uh, but every now and then, if something disastrous is about to happen, the shield may come and say, no, 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 I don't like that uh, output. You're leaving the winning region. Don't do that. Uh, I will give you a different output. Um, now, the hope here, of course, is uh, sort of all of the smartness that the designer or the machine learning algorithm has put into the system. This gets preserved. Uh, you know, as long as nothing bad happens, you don't see the shield, it's completely uh, transparent. Uh, but if something bad happens, it, uh, it interferes. So you get the best of both worlds, right? You get a brilliant machine learning system with guarantees. Now, if I claim that verification is impossible, then synthesis should be even harder. Uh, and, and here, the hope is that that is not true. Uh, the critical spec, uh, remember, is, is, is supposed to be really small. So you should be able to synthesize a shield out of it. Now, how exactly the synthesis works, I'll, I'll spend a few more words on that. But, but basically, you know, if you can write down a specification of what the shield should do, you can build it automatically. Um, so is this a completely new idea? Uh, no, it's not, right? Uh, if you uh, have your own traffic light controller system in your back backyard, you can buy things like this, right? So you can Google for this thing. It's called the Traffitech CMU conflict monitor unit. And you hook this up to your traffic light system. And uh, if you look in the manual, it says uh, when two channels, so that's two traffic lights that uh, sort of intersect, if two channels are in conflict, uh, this box here 
will activate a conflict signal. The signal is read by the traffic controller, which will then place the intersection in flash. Right? So that means it's nice. You've programmed your, um, your traffic lights and you've made a mistake. And so the thing runs uh, correctly for a long time, but at some point something goes wrong, a bug turns up. And this little box will notice and, uh, and your intersection will go into flashing, I don't know, yellow or flashing red, one of the two. Uh, and uh, people will start paying attention and everything will be fine. Um, so this is kind of what we, uh, what we want. Uh, what we like here is that this box, you don't have to tell it what your traffic light controller is like. It's not going to look inside of it. It treats it as a black box. So that we want to keep. Um, but I'm not so happy with this thing for two reasons. Um, so the first thing is uh, I don't want it hard coded for you know intersections. I want it to be able to deal with sort of general specifications. And I want to automatically build this box from spec. And the other thing I'm not so happy with here is sort of if something goes wrong, then we do the dumbest possible thing, right? We we go into fail safe mode. And, and uh, you know, maybe we'll send a text message to uh, to somebody who will come and reset the intersection and then uh, start it from scratch. You want something smarter in some way. Okay, so let's try and formalize that a little bit. Um, so what do we want? And uh, I have a picture of our system here. So I had the system and the shield again. And the first thing I want, uh, and I hope that this is obvious, is that uh, so between the input to the system and the output of the shielded system, this pair should fulfill the specification, right? The shielded system should be correct. Um, so you'd think this is enough, uh, but you'd be wrong. Um, if you only require this, then you can just do synthesis on your spec, and your shield will just look at the inputs and produce new outputs and it doesn't have to look at the system. I can just remove this uh, arrow over here. Um, so what's missing in my, um, in my presentation here is the fact that the shield should sort of uh, normally just do what the system uh, proposes. Um, so, um, so we want minimum interference and I'll split that into two properties. The first thing that I want is that, um, okay, so two words. I will use the word violation to, uh, to mean that the system does something wrong. Uh, it goes into an action so that I cannot guarantee that in the future it will always uh, stick to the spec. It does something wrong. Uh, and deviation, I will say if the shield changes the output uh, of the system, I will call that a deviation. So the first thing is, don't touch the outputs of the system unless you absolutely have to, right? Deviate only if necessary. And this means that as long as the, the run of the system doesn't have a failure, um, you will not see, uh, you will not notice the shield. And then the second thing, and this is a little bit vaguer and less clear, um, I sort of want to have as little deviation as possible. Um, I want, I don't want the intersection to go into flashing yellow mode. I, if there's two traffic lights that cannot both be green at the same time, well, then change one to red. Uh, but don't just completely reset the system, right? And the idea is here that even if you have a failure, um, the shield will sort of enforce these critical properties. But there's a whole bunch of other properties that the system has. Um, and you want to retain as many of these as you can. You cannot kind of really guarantee that because you don't know what the non-critical properties are, uh, but you want O and O prime to be as close as possible. Um, how do you do that? So, so let me give you uh, one idea on how to do that. And then you, know, you can think of uh, more ideas of your own. Um, so if, uh, this here is the arrow of time. Um, so initially, Everything is fine. The system is just uh, going along, doing everything it's supposed to do. So the shield cannot touch the output. And then um, the specification might be violated by the system. Uh, this means that from now on, the shield can change the output a little bit. 
And sort of the simplest thing you could think of here is uh, to have a bound and to say that the shield can change the outputs for k steps. Um, when the k steps are over, the deviation changing the output is forbidden again. And if then another error comes, then you can change the outputs uh, for k steps again. Um, there's a few difficulties in this um, uh, definition, right? So you have to figure out what it means to have two violations of the uh, of the specification. This is not very well defined, um, but you, know, you can think of a way to deal with it. And and and, and then there's sort of a sim simplistic idea. I'm sure you can think of something better, right? As soon as you have uh, whatever a steering wheel with a tilt. Um, you know, uh, turning the steering wheel 90 degrees the other direction is probably a bigger deviation than just uh, turning it by uh, one degree. All right, so it depends on your uh, application domain here. Okay, um, so then um, you um, want to do, uh, you want to build the shield. Um, and I have to look at my time. Uh, what can you do? You use uh, games. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try and, and skip the uh, formalization here because uh, um, it will take too much time. Um, but you, we have these uh, three requirements, right? You say the shield has to be correct. Uh, so the input output uh, relation has to fit with, uh, with the spec. Um, it can deviate only if necessary. This is not so hard to formalize, right? You know what the spec is. Um, so you, you can play a game on this and you know when a, an action that is proposed is not a winning, um, not a winning move in your game. Uh, so this is the moment when the shield can interfere, um, and you want the shield to um, deviate as little as possible. So the simple solution here is um, you keep track of when there's a difference between what the shield says and what the system says, uh, and uh, then the, the shield has to as quickly as possible go back into a mode where it just copies the system output into the shield output. You can uh, uh, um, specify this as a view key game. Um, the important thing here is, is sort of you, you don't, uh, on this slide, I'm not trying to implement the shield. I'm trying to say, what are the properties that the shield should have? And as soon as I have these properties, you guys all know about synthesis. You give this to your favorite uh, synthesis tool, and it'll give you a shield. And I have an example, but I'll just uh, uh, skip it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you have, let me just show you sort of abstractly the slide, right? So you have a normal mode in which whatever the traffic light controller in this case does is just copied by the shield. You have things that the shield is just not allowed to do. And you have a recovery mode in which the shield has changed the output of the system. And then it's quickly as possible to go back to the normal mode. Okay. So let's skip that and give you more interesting examples, right? Um, so, th so this is uh, sort of the the main idea, uh, right? Uh, so you have the system maybe as complicated as possible. You want to change the outputs only if necessary and as little as possible. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff around this, right? So a shield may not exist. Uh, the, the question, the answer to your synthesis question may be, no, this is not realizable. You cannot always guarantee, say, a finite recovery time. Then you have to do something else. Uh, you could think of uh, collaborative strategies, for instance. Um, but let me show you um, some examples here in the next uh, five minutes or so. So machine learning, let me skip the uh, philosophy here and uh, go straight to an example. So um, we have the same picture here that, uh, that I had before, right? Now, instead of what I call the system, we have a learning agent. Uh, here we've made the environment explicit. So there's observations, there's rewards. And I have a shield that sits after the learning agent in this case, and it may change the actions of the learning agents. Now there's a couple of different um, decisions you could take here on how to train the learning agent. So the, the important, important thing I think is that the shield is in place during learning. 
so you know that nothing horrible happens while the agent learns. The shield, of course, is still there when the agent is done learning when you are in the field and, and the system is just running. Uh, because this learning agent, no matter what you do with it, doesn't give you any guarantees, right? Now, there's different choices on what you do with the rewards. If the learning agent does something bad, uh, something that you correct, do you slap it on the wrist? Or do you say, well, it doesn't matter because the shield um, corrects the action anyway? And these are sort of parameters you can play with and you can uh, uh, see what works best. Um, in practice, we, you know, we give a negative feedback. It's this sort of seems to generalize. Um, so here you see um, an, uh, an example. This is sort of our prototypical example of, uh, of shielding. Uh, Pac-Man, so on the left, uh, this is a standard machine learning thing. It's learning how to eat the dots. And if, if Pac-Man gets eaten, that's a high negative reward. On the right, um, the machine learning system is still trying to eat the dots. Um, I know how to formalize that, but it becomes very complicated. The shield makes sure that Pac-Man doesn't get eaten. So if Pac-Man wants to go in the wrong direction, wants to go into a dead end, uh, then the shield will interfere. And then you see that, I think you saw it over here at some point where, yeah, where it keeps going around and waits for, uh, uh, for the ghost to go away so that it can uh, eat the last dots. Um, so this is nice. On the right, I have guarantees. Spectrum will never get eaten. Uh, and still machine learning is very good. Um, what you see as well, if you look at this, is that um, we can learn these things more quickly. Um, you see the rewards here uh, without a shield and an orange with a shield. So rewards go up quickly and stay high from there. Um, there's no guarantee. So, so I can guarantee that your learning algorithm will still converge even if you have a shield. I cannot guarantee that it's faster and I have um, examples where this is not the case. Um, but there's a, lot, there's a bunch of examples where it is the case. Okay, um, so then what, what you're thinking here is, uh, well, that's nice, but uh, when I last played Pac-Man, there were uh, four ghosts and uh, the grid was a lot bigger. Uh, so that's what you really want to do, uh, right? Um, so uh, you formalize this, this thing uh, with the four ghosts. Uh, the ghosts here are obviously uh, modeled as adversarial, right? You don't know where they're going. You want to be safe. And then obviously, or well, obviously to me by now, uh, the tool says I cannot build a shield for that. Uh, that is not realizable. Why not? Uh, because if you have four ghosts, it's very simple for them to corner uh, Pac-Man uh, into one corner of the, uh, of the field and eat him. Um, so you're going to lose. Um, so what do you do? So, so this is realistic, right? If you're um, sort of driving your um, uh, autonomous car on the highway, uh, you want to make sure that you're safe. Uh, this is uh, not going to work. The only way to have 100% uh, guarantees on autonomous driving is if you leave your car in the, in the driveway. Um, so what you could do here is, um, is you could learn what these, sorry, what these ghosts do uh, as a probabilistic model. So you can model each of the ghosts as a Markov chain. Um, and then how to control Pac-Man becomes a Markov decision process. So it's a, it's a game with a probabilistic aspect. There's a, one player, which is you, and half a player, which is chance. Um, and then you can say, well, I want a property like I'm not, Pac-Man is not going to be eaten in with a probability larger than 5% within the next 10 steps. So I no longer have hard guarantees here and now my uh, guarantees become uh, probabilistic. So let's look at that. I have that as well. well let's see. Yes, there we go. So this is slower. So on the left, you again, you see uh, the original Pac-Man, no shield and you'll get eaten. On the right, you'll see Pac-Man with a shield. Uh, he also gets eaten uh, occasionally, uh, but not nearly as much. And what you see are these traffic lights. So when uh, Pac-Man comes to an intersection, uh, 
he poses a question to the shield and he says, are the chances of getting eaten for these directions acceptable or not? And uh, sort of, you always want to have at least one green light and then this is a safe direction that you can go in. And as you'll see, there are sometimes, uh, sometimes there are no good choices. Uh, and, uh, yeah, things may go wrong. Um, okay. Um, yeah, and I think I'm running out of time. Um, so there's lots of things you can do here, right? So I've presented this as sort of something where you can guarantee safety constraints. But look at this as something to you know, increase performance of a learning system, whereby so local, making local decisions more smartly using a formal model, you can react very well to situations where, where you didn't train for them. Um, you can extend this to time systems. Uh, you can extend this to multi-agent systems, uh, but also you can say uh, it's, uh, we've been going on for 25 minutes and we should go uh, for a coffee break. So I'm not going to talk about all of this. Um, I, I think they're all sort of relatively straightforward well, extensions of the basic idea. Maybe that's a bit uh, uh, exaggerated, uh, but uh, the basic idea is the main thing that uh, you should understand. Okay, so let's see, I should be able to click here. No, all right. Um, Give me a second. Then I will skip to the end. Good. Yeah. So um, I talked about shields. Right, so the idea is, uh, you know, you have a system, the system is almost perfect, uh, maybe it is even perfect, but I have no guarantees and I want to add guarantees onto the system. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, assumptions, right, so uh, the system acts as a reactive system. Um, it's something where I can write down specifications and I can actually verify whether the specification has uh, been fulfilled or not. So we're not talking about any of this fuzzy stuff like in uh, image uh, recognition. Um, and then we uh, um, build a runtime enforcement module that can guarantee correct correctness and doesn't change the output too much uh, if it doesn't have to. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other things uh, you can do, right? So uh, we've only talked about Boolean systems. What about non-Boolean systems? Uh, what about distributed shields? Uh, we, what about partial observability? Um, I don't know the answers to all of this, uh, but I'm sure there is uh, many more ideas that uh, we could follow. Okay, so that's it from my side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Roderick. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat or Q&A, uh, but I have a question. Um, so what, for shield synthesis, what information do we need about the system or about the environment in order to synthesize the shield? Can you clarify that for us? So we, we treat both the system and the environment in, in the basic setting as adversarial. Um, now you can change your mind and you could see either the environment or the system as a probabilistic um, entity. Um, and sort of the simplest answer I think is then that you need no information about the environment or about the system. Um, and then you get back to sort of the standard question of when you verify something, right? Can you just assume that the system, that, that the environment can do anything? Um, so you may need an, uh, assumptions on the environment. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. So the, the other aspect of this maybe is that so we, we have this assumption that you know, we can represent everything in a state-based system, that there's uh, enough observability and that there's actually, I, I can always make a statement of, this is correct. This is not. Uh, this is not correct. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm just wondering because it seems like uh, if you had no information, it's back to the full reactive synthesis setting, right? Effectively, if you're assuming that these are adversarial. And then also, uh, if, you do, if you don't use any information about the system, how do you guarantee this uh, minimum deviation property? Um, so you, um, okay, so, so you look at the, uh, at the system as, let's say a refinement of the, let's say you start with a safety specification, right? And then your system is a refinement of your, uh, of your safety specification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm finding a little bit, but that's close enough. Um, so, so um, you always know where the system is inside of your safety spec. You can follow this um, until something goes wrong. And, and then you have to sort of start making assumptions. And, and our basic assumption is that if the system does something wrong, um, it's still, it's going to be knocked off. It'll be in a different state maybe, but it will still be in some state. Uh, inside of the safety specification. And so you have, so you have to figure out where it is uh, and then to start following it again. Um, so this is in a way the, uh, the worst case assumption, right? If you have a Byzantine system, then you have no chance that you'll go back to sort of synchronizing with it. Um, if it's, um, yeah, but if it's not Byzantine, if it's just a, a, like a glitch, uh, then you have to figure out what the state is that it's in. And you can do that by just observing its outputs. And, and again, the, when I talk about the state that the system in, is in, I'm talking about the, the safety automaton for the specification mm -hmm. uh, of which the system is refined. All right. Does that make All sense? Right. Yeah, thank you, Roderick. Uh, there's, yeah. there's another question on, uh, on Q&A, but I think we'll have to move on to the next talk. Uh, but I hope you can answer that, Roderick. Um, Okay, our next speaker is uh, is Professor Neer Peterman.